Hello everyone, welcome back. We are now in week six of C151. It is amazing that time has flown this fast, but we are now in our last week of reading the actual fairy tales that we're using as our source material when we're gonna be talking about adaptations down the line. We have done Germany, we have done France and a smidge of Italy, and now we are going to be talking about Scandinavian fairy tales today, um, which will be Danish and Norwegian for the most part. Now, uh, there is a PowerPoint to go alongside this, so I hope you have that pulled up while we are going through it together. So, after the title slide, we're going to begin talking about the Danish Golden Age of Arts and Letters. This was the period of time that resulted in the production of a lot of famous Danish fairy tales. This actually begins at the end of the 18th century, so if you're thinking about timeline-wise, what we've discussed so far, uh, this is happening... This uh, end of the 18th century here is right after the French Vogue ended and right before the Grimm's really got going. So the end of the 18th century um, is when Enlightenment ideas came to Denmark via Germany, leading to a brief wave of progressivism. Now there's a whole saga about um, how these Enlightenment ideas came from Germany to Denmark, and there is actually a fictional film about it that is based on the historical events called A Royal Affair, and it has Mads Mikkelsen and Alicia Vikander in it. I actually watched it for a course a few years ago. Highly recommend it. After all of the drama that happened at that point in time, the Enlightenment ideas that had led to a brief wave of progressivism in Denmark were reversed by those who um, were better off or felt that they were better off with more conservative economic and social principles. Um, this led to a conservative government and Denmark became embroiled in multiple conflicts involving France and Britain. In the wake of much destruction, opportunities arose for architects, artists, and writers inspired by German Romanticism to launch a golden age of creativity in Denmark. Hans Christian Andersen was one of these people. He lived and worked during much of this golden age, uh, which lasted until about 1850. On the next slide, I have a portrait of him. Uh, Hans Christian Andersen was born in Odense, Denmark in 1805. He grew up very poor and left for Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, at the age of 14. He had a very troubled career. He failed to become an actor. He didn't really make it as a poet or a writer until he discovered the form of the fairy tale and published his collection in 1835. If you are interested in a lot more information about Hans Christian Andersen, every so often um, the German department offers a course on him and that's the course that I took where we watched A Royal Affair. It was great. I highly recommend it. So um, keep an eye out for that if you are interested in, in any point in something like that. Though Anderson's collection was inspired by folk tales, most of his stories are of his own creation. So you will see some if you are to read a lot of his fairy tales just out of shot here. Um, you will recognize some forms like the wild swans, um, has similarities to grim stories. There's a couple of others, um, but for the most part, he invented them on his own. Uh, he never married, though he had unrequited romances with both men and women. This is kind of a go around in pop culture, but if any of you have seen The Greatest Showman and um, are familiar with the character of Jenny Lind, Jenny Lind was one of the people whom Hans Christian Andersen was in love with, and it is believed that he wrote the story The Little Mermaid about her. That's quite a bit of speculation, but they did live at the same time and he is known to have been infatuated with her. So um, if you're familiar with that character from that show, she was an actual historical figure um, and Hans Christian Andersen was in unrequited love with her. Uh, he was um, deeply concerned with class inequity and industrialization, both which were huge um, issues in 19th century Europe in general, but especially Denmark. He grew up very poor, so of course he was always going to be um, inclined toward elevating the poor. However, he never stopped wanting to be part of the upper classes. So a lot of his fairy tales um, include this tension of, you know, wanting the betterment of the poor, but not necessarily wanting to get rid of the upper class because he also wants to be part of the upper class. And he never quite pulled this off. Another quick little aside about Hans Christian Andersen that I love. He traveled Europe extensively 
um, and also was at one time friends with Charles Dickens and stayed um, with Charles Dickens in England for a period of time. However, he stayed so long and was such an obnoxious house guest that Charles Dickens never spoke to him again, or at least never wrote to him again after that point in time. So he was an extremely socially awkward individual and it kind of prevented him from achieving uh, some of the status that he had always hoped to achieve in life. Although he certainly has a lasting legacy having written these fairy tales. Now jumping just across the sea to Norway, we'll talk about Norway in the 19th century a bit. Uh, Norway had been in union with Denmark actually for 434 years until 1814, which was this period of struggle uh, that led to the Danish golden age of arts and letters. Denmark had to cede Norway to Sweden after the Napoleonic Wars, and Norway was in union with Sweden, but remained and maintained partial independence. Norwegian nationalism and romanticism arose as part of this ar arrangement and persisted through the 1860s. So Norway wasn't a country on its own yet, but the people wanted it to be. Um, and so th there was this wave of, of nationalism and national and pursuit of national identity that came up in the 19th century. And this was true across a lot of Europe. We saw this with the Grimm brothers as well, that they wanted Germany to be unified under a single German identity and culture. Here we have a portrait of Peter Christian Abzirnsen uh, and Jürgen Engelbretsen Mo. Uh, as Bjornsson, born in 1812, was actually a zoologist and a teacher, and Mo was a minister. Uh, Norway had recently won partial, partial independence from Sweden, and the two men wanted to collect Norwegian folk tales to reflect the national spirit. The collection is published in Bookmull, the first written form of Norwegian which Asbjørnsen and Mo helped develop. So it's important to understand that although Norwegian was a spoken language, it didn't have a written form at this point in time because everything was written in Swedish. So uh, Asbjørnsen and Mo were part of the movement that helped develop a written form of the language of Norwegian. Their stories were collected in the same manner that the Grimm's advocated, and they explicitly took the Grimm's as their model for their efforts. Um, and they went directly into communities in order to um, receive the stories. And as a matter of fact, from a folklor folkloristic perspective, they um, were a little bit more effective than the Grimm's at actually going into folk communities. Um, the Grimm's kind of received it through a filter um, through their like rich and educated friends and so forth. Uh, so they were actually a little bit more methodologically sound than even the Grimm brothers were. So that's our context for both Denmark and Norway. We're going to jump back to Hans Christian Andersen because we read The Little Mermaid this week. And I can almost guarantee that it is not at all like the Disney movie if you have watched the Disney movie. Like there are surface similarities. But the main heart of the story, the mermaid's main conflict, is not really the same. So I have some questions here um, to make you think about this a little bit. What stylistically sets this story apart from the other folk tales that we've read? Um, in what ways is it similar to the French tales? So if you're thinking about how the story is written and how it is told, does it more resemble the German tales or does it take a more literary approach like the French tales do? Now, Anderson uses the tale to pose big, big questions about souls, relationships, and sacrifice. So what ways in the story does he accomplish this? And then what other thoughts or connections arise from reading this tale? So we're not going to watch the Disney Little Mermaid movie as part of this semester, but if you would like to, it's actually probably a great topic for a final research paper to compare uh, the source material of The Little Mermaid with the Disney version of The Little Mermaid. Um, because there are some things that are quite strikingly similar. Um, for instance, the way that Anderson describes the undersea world um, is very much reflected in the way Disney chose to animate it. Uh, however, the main conflict in Anderson's story, she doesn't necessarily want the man, she just wants the soul that she can acquire by marrying a man, um, whereas it is pure romance in the Disney version. So you can think a little bit about why Disney would simplify the story this way 
what elements it took out. For example, the gore, definitely not gore <laughs> in the Disney version. Um, and, and why these changes might have been made. So think about that a little bit. We also read another story called The Wild Swans, which I particularly like. Though it is Anderson's own in many ways, this is one of the stories he has. It was one of his earlier to stories uh, that was um, derived from ATU Type 451, which is very similar to the Grimm story, The Six Swans. Um, so in Anderson's, there's 12. In Grimm's, there's six. And Grimm's have a couple other variants of ATU 451, uh, which are like the 12 Ravens or the 12 Brothers, things like that. They have the same format, but the actual details are slightly different. Um, I do have, I think just the one retelling of 451 right here, Daughter of the Forest by Juliet Marillier. Now the Wild Swans shares similar themes with The Little Mermaid. Can we hypothesize why Anderson might include these in more than one tale? I'm thinking about silence for instance, and sacrifice, some of these main ideas that stick in both of these stories um, and several others that Anderson has written. Uh, we're gonna jump back to Norway and talk about East of the Sun and West of the Moon, which as I mentioned in the uh, very beginning of the course is quite actually my favorite fairy tale, my favorite folk tale. Um, it is ATU 425, a, which means it is related to Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast itself is 425C, so there's subtypes of the main um, 425 category. So I have a couple questions here. What features of a folktale can you find in this story? And how can we compare this variant to Beauty and the Beast? And what is the significance in these differences? And while we're here, I figure I'll pull out my illustrated version again, which is right here. And as a matter of fact, everything from the end of the bookshelf to here, these are all Beauty and the Beast retellings or 425 retellings. And this is actually probably only about half of the Beauty and the Beast retellings I own because I'm writing my dissertation in part on Beauty and the Beast and also Cinderella. So several of them are in another room where I am working on that research project. But back to our illustrated version here. This is illustrated by Kay Nielsen. Um, who is a highly acclaimed illustrator of fairy tales from the early 20th century. Uh, so I am going to pull up the illustrations and here's just, that's just the cover page there, the title page. And he has um, several fairy tales in here. So this is one of the more famous illustrations of the girl on the polar bear's back. A beautiful image of when the taboo is broken and the prince must go uh, to the troll kingdom. An image of her crying after she has been traveling for a long time and still can't get east of the sun and west of the moon. This is an illustration of the north wind. As you can see, he's a very powerful figure, um, you know, moving the sea waves around. And here is the illustration of the two characters leaving east of the sun and west of the moon and heading home for their happily ever after. So this is a beautiful collection. I actually found it at the book corner here in Bloomington, which is right on the corner of Kirkwood and Walnut. So um, if you're interested in wandering through there, they actually have a pretty decent um, folktale and folklore collection there. So again, East of the Sun and West of the Moon, one of my favorite fairy tales because of how um, the heroine goes on this great adventure in order to um, find her true love. So there's a lot more agency on the part of the young woman in this story than there is in something like Beauty and the Beast or many of the other fairy tales that we've read. The other Norwegian fairy tale I had you read was The Pancake, which you might recognize as the gingerbread man. The pancake is an example of what is called a chain tale. It is a particular genre of oral narrative um, that builds upon itself with repetition and wordplay. So you might recognize something like a chain tale from there once was a lady who, followed, who swallowed a fly in order to, um, to catch the fly. She swallowed a mouse to catch the mouse. She swallowed a cat to catch the cat. She swallowed a dog and so forth. That is an, another example of a chain tale that you might be familiar with. Um, it builds itself on repetition and wordplay. 
Now, we've had many examples of eating and food in the fairy tales that we've read. How do you think that this tale fits into all of that? So we've had examples of cannibalism already, um, examples of magical food, uh, things like that. Uh, so how might um, a story about a piece of food running away play into some of these ideas that we've seen so far about food and sustenance and starvation and other things like that. It's a fun story, but there's still subtext. Warner chapter 23 is one that you should have read for today. So we're going to jump in and talk about that a bit. Warner actually begins her chapter talking about Cordelia from the story of King Lear. Most of you probably know King Lear from Shakespeare's play if you read it in high school or maybe in a different English class. Uh, King Lear uh, is not a Shakespearean invention. He pulled that from existing English legend and then expanded the characters and the, and the plot line. Uh, so Warner talks about this legend about Cordelia and King Lear and the relationships between father and daughter. What are some of the points she makes and how is it linked to the tales that we read for today, as well as the ones that we've read in the past, particularly Aller Laihau? Warner makes connections between silence, sacrifice, and sexuality, which we're finding to be extremely relevant to the stories we read today, particularly Anderson. What is your understanding of these connections so far between silence, sacrifice, and sexuality? And what are some of the troubling implications of Warner's analysis of the tales that we've read for today? Like, she's kind of laying bare some elements of the story that might make us really uncomfortable and challenges the way that we understand stories and storytelling, particularly these stories that have been familiar to us possibly for a very long time. So think about what the consequences are of these analyses and not necessarily negative ones. They're, I think they're neutral, all things considered, but they do make us think in rather challenging ways. That is the end of our discussion on Norwegian and Scandinavian fairy tales. I hope you enjoyed these ones. I particularly like um, Anderson and the Norwegian fairy tales. So uh, stay tuned. We are also going to be talking about Russian fairy tales this week. So watch that lecture as well. Don't forget your discussion post and your, uh, sorry, your knowledge check as well. Um, and keep up with your reading. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me and I will see you in the next lecture.